So welcome back to part two of our discussion on second derivatives. Now in part one, we discussed what a second derivative was. We also introduced three different notations that you can use for second derivatives, and we also introduced a visual intuition that you can use to actually figure out what they look like. Now at the end of the last lesson, I promised to show you an example of exactly why they're useful and exactly how we can use them. So let me go ahead and deliver on that promise now. Okay, so I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in charge of designing the next soccer ball for the next Soccer World Cup. Okay, I'm going to attach your model soccer ball to a strange device, and I'm going to tell you what it does in just a moment. Okay, so one of the things you're going to have to do to design a really good soccer ball is to actually investigate how much air resistance there's going to be as you shoot the wind past the soccer ball. Okay, so I hope you noticed that when we started blowing the wind over the soccer ball, the soccer ball went left a little bit. Now this device over here actually has a spring inside of it, and the spring is pushing back against the wind, which is trying to push the soccer ball left. As we increase the speed of the wind, I hope you can see that the soccer ball is going to get pushed on harder, and therefore the spring is going to compress even more. In order to keep the ball still, the spring has to push back just as hard as the wind is pushing to the left. If we measure how hard the spring is pushing back on the ball, we're also indirectly measuring how hard the wind is pushing on the ball as well. So by using this contraption, you can measure the exact amount of air resistance that the ball is experiencing when the wind is hitting it at different speeds. So you decide to run a little bit of an experiment. You decide to actually change the wind speed, which you can do by using a fan over here. And then you want to investigate exactly how this affects the force, which you can do by measuring the amount of force applied by the spring. After doing this for a whole afternoon, you gather a whole bunch of data about your ball. Unfortunately, the maximum speed of your fan is only about 26 or 27 meters per second, but that's okay, you've already got all of this data. So this is actually something quite interesting about the way a soccer ball flies. If you manage to give the soccer ball enough speed so that it passes this point over here, the amount of air resistance on the ball actually ends up decreasing. So you'd like to figure out exactly when the force on this ball is increasing at an increasing rate or increasing at a decreasing rate. Now you can get that information by differentiating some function, but the problem here is that you don't actually have a function to differentiate. But that's not really a problem, because most graphing software these days is actually able to fit a curve to your data. So if we actually try fitting a cubic to this data, we get the following equation. Okay, so in this experiment, we're not using x and y. We're saying that the input is v and the output is f. So in other words, we could say that f is a function of v. And we'd write that like this. We're saying that f is equal to some function of v. And now we can actually go ahead and graph this function on this curve over here. Now of course, the graph of this function over here is only going to make sense in the domain where we actually collected some data. If you try exiting this domain, you're going to get nonsensical predictions because you just don't have the data to back it up. Now in order to find the areas where the force is increasing at an increasing rate, or at a decreasing rate, we need the second derivative of this function. In order to do that, we're just going to differentiate the function twice. So let's start with its first derivative. Okay, so we can see that the derivative of 1 on 100 times minus v cubed plus 28v squared plus 17v is the same thing as 1 on 100 times minus 3v squared plus 56v plus 17. If we want the derivative of the derivative, we should just differentiate the derivative again. Okay, so this is great. The second derivative of this function, f of v, is just equal to this function right here. And now we'd like to see if it actually matches up with our intuitions that we built up right here. To do this, I'm going to go ahead and pick two points on our graph that we can use to compare our different values. Okay, so as you can see, we'd like to compare the second derivatives at 5 and 25. So as we can see, the force at both of these points is positive. And therefore, if you subbed in v equals 5 or 25, you should find that both of these values are positive. However, at this point over here, when v equals 5, you notice that the gradient is positive. But at the point where v equals 25, you should see that the gradient is negative. You can test this by just subbing in these values of v. However, what I'm actually interested in comparing are the values of the second derivatives at 5 and 25. So let me start by replacing v for 5. And then I'll just go ahead and substitute the right-hand side into a calculator. Okay, so by doing this, we got a value of 0 0.26. And this indicates that the force on the soccer ball is increasing at an increasing rate 
when the velocity is equal to 5. And now we can repeat this at the point where v is equal to 25, by replacing all the 5s for 25s. Okay, so I left this on fast forward a little bit longer, because I just repeated the exact same steps. I started by replacing v for 25, and then I plugged it into the calculator and found that it was equal to minus 0 0.94, which I've copied down over here. Okay, so that means at this point where the velocity is 25, you can see that the function is actually decreasing, but because the second derivative is negative, it's decreasing at a decreasing rate. Now, if you'd like to, you can check some other points as well. For example, if you tried 15, you'd notice that it's increasing, but it's going to be doing so at a decreasing rate. But I hope the two that I've shown you should be enough proof that this is a really great way to think about the second derivative. So with this, we've actually completed our example. Okay, so now there's actually just one more point to make about the second derivative, and it's going to lead on to a point that I'm going to discuss in a future lesson. So what I'm saying here is you can actually visualize the second derivative by using a little parabola. I'm going to help you do this by actually copying these pictures over and showing you the parabolas. Okay, so for example, in the case where we have a negative second derivative, we'd say that we can also visualize this with a concave down parabola. And now, in the case where we have a second derivative that's actually positive, we can visualize this with a concave up parabola, as you can kind of see here. And now, finally, in the case where your slope doesn't actually change, a parabola doesn't really make much sense, so the parabola of best fit is actually this straight line over here. Now, this actually makes sense if we look at the graph. For example, over here we have a parabola that looks like it's concave down, and its second derivative, if we follow it down, is negative. Over here we have a parabola that looks like it's concaved up, and if we follow the second derivative down again, we can see that its second derivative is actually positive this time. This will make sense if you just look back at the graph. Over here we can see that we have a concave down parabola, and if you look at its second derivative, it looks like it's negative. Over here it looks like we have a concave up parabola, and if we look at its second derivative, it looks like it's positive. And similarly, in areas where it looks like we have a straight line, if we follow the graph down, it looks like the second derivative just equals zero. So this actually brings us to an interesting point. If for some function we only know the original function value, then we only know the height at the function. But if we know the first derivative, we kind of have the line of best fit. If, however, we have the second derivative as well, we sort of have the parabola of best fit as well. Again, this is something I'm going to discuss much further in a future lesson. So now I'd just like to summarize. In this lesson, I introduced the second derivative, which can be written in any of these three forms. We said that you can find the second derivative by taking some function, differentiating it once, and then just differentiating it again. By carefully investigating the graphs, we were able to show that the second derivative measures the rate at which the slope is changing. So in the case where the slope is not changing, the second derivative would be zero. If the slope is changing upwards, then we'd say that the second derivative is positive, and if the slope is changing to move downwards, then the second derivative is negative. And similarly, if the function is going upwards at a higher rate, we'd say that the second derivative must be larger. And finally, we said that we could visualize the second derivative by using parabolic sections. In the case where the second derivative is positive, we'd expect an upward parabola, and in the case where it's negative, we'd expect the concavity of the parabola to be negative. And now with this, we've actually completed our discussion on the second derivatives.